Hello, everybody. This is, this is really cool here. I think I'm born in the wrong century, actually. So, who of you has ever written a business plan? Put your hands up. Okay. Who of you has spent more than, let's say, a month to write a business plan? Come on, be honest. Okay. You wasted your time, right? You know that. Okay, you wasted your time. Now, who of you in your business plan has done something like this? If you look up there, drawn this kind of curve, right? Who's done that? And who's invented the numbers? <laughs> we all know, you know, this is intellectual masturbation, right? Okay? I needed something to wake you up, so I thought that would be a provocative term. So today we know that business plans don't work, okay? So that's not how we do entrepreneurship. I'll talk a little bit about how we do entrepreneurship today, and many of you are already practicing this. So the first thing we need that we're going to look at is a better language to discuss business issues. And one of the things that we introduced in business model generation is the business model canvas. So I'll see if I'm going to talk about this, but who of you has never heard of the business model canvas? Fine if you. Who of you has used it already? Okay. So I'll actually quickly introduce it because we'll use that as a starting point for a new canvas that we created just a couple of uh, months ago, a couple of weeks ago. The second thing that's important when we do entrepreneurship is we don't just stick to one idea, but actually we should do prototypes. Prototypes exploring very different alternatives, different possibilities. Maybe a business model that has high switching costs, a business model with recurring revenues, not just transactional revenues, a business model with no fixed costs, just variable costs. So prototyping is the second issue. Let's see if you can see that. And the third one we're going to look at, the third one is what we now know in entrepreneurship is really important and more important than any business plan. It's not sticking to the first business model, but pivoting, iterating through different business models, right? So you get out of the building, to quote Steve Blank, inventor of the customer development methodology, you want to test, you want to test, you want to test, okay? These three things is what you need to do to do real entrepreneurship. And this is increasingly being taught around the world in startup schools and in incubators and in, in accelerators. This is how we do it today, right? So what we're going to do to this business plan, since I just crossed it out, we're actually going to burn our business plan, OK? Don't ever do a business plan again, OK? This is burning. Burn your business plan, OK? If you wrote one, go home and burn it. Go to your office and burn it. Feels good, I promise you. So let's look at the first thing. Um, since all of you know what the business model, many of you know what the business model canvas is, I won't show you an introductory video. I'll just show you the canvas, OK? And what's important here, when we came up with this tool to describe business models, we were trying to figure out what are the most important decisions you make for your business logic, for the blueprint of your strategy, what are those most important questions? And we came up with nine, from the customers to the value propositions, the channels, all the way to the partnerships and costs and revenues, right? So you want to look at all of these. Now, what's really important is that you don't just talk. So one phenomena, when you watch people when they say, OK, we need to find a business model for our product, or we need to find a new business model in this particular industry, what are people going to do? They're going to do this. I'm sure you've been these kind of meetings. You have five smart people around the room, or let's take four smart people around the room, in, around a table in a room, and somebody starts talking. Blah, right? Blah, blah, blah. If you don't use a language like the business small canvas, you won't understand each other. Right? Next person's turn. OK, blah. Oops. This is what you call blah, blah, blah. 
Ever been in a meeting like that? Right? Okay, let's burn this one as well. A lot of fire today. Okay, a lot of fire today. So what you really want to do is you want to take tools, and the business model canvas is one. You can choose whatever you want. We figured out that this is one that really works. You want to sketch out the different pieces of your business models. Which customers are you targeting? Sticky note. What are you offering them? Sticky note. How are you reaching them? Sticky note. How are you earning money from them? Sticky note. And here's, here's the big idea. It's not about the individual pieces. It's not about the revenue streams alone. It's not about the channels alone. It's about how the, the thing fits together to create a story. The story of how you are going to succeed with your business, maybe disrupt the market. So again and again, I see people, they would put up a sticky note in revenue streams, and they would have no customer paying for that, and it wouldn't come for a, from a value proposition that they're paying for. That seems crazy, no? Trivial. Somebody would put a sticky note there. Yet I see again and again and again, startups, senior executives that would put up, fill up that box revenue streams with a lot of sticky notes and say we're earning money from this, from this, from this, without describing what's the value proposition that the customers are, pay, are paying for. Now, when you think about everything together, that's when you will never have a sticky note that is disconnected from the rest. So let me give you an example. It's my favorite one. So, so I'm a big espresso fan. So I'll show you a little example. Let's see if this actually works. Whoops. Give me a second. We're going to talk about coffee for a second. And I'm going to use here numbers from Switzerland very quickly. Because this is a business model with a story. It's not just a collection of individual pieces. And I'll talk about coffee for a second. And some of you might have seen this on YouTube because it's my favorite example. I'll use data from Switzerland. How much do you think do we pay less or more for coffee consumed at home in Switzerland? What, did you, what do you think? 20% less, 20% more? What would your guess be? More? OK, how much more? 30%? 70 percent? OK? This is a commodities business, right? You go to the supermarket, you have a lot of different choices of coffee. Well, it turns out somebody said 500%. It's actually more than that. It's 600 to 800 percent across Europe and increasingly in the UK and in, in, in the US and Canada and other places around the world like Japan. People are paying six to eight times more for coffee, a commodities product. So when you see these kind of numbers, your first reaction should be, damn, how did they do that? Could I learn from them and copy that? Now, what is it behind this success? It's not George Clooney. Though sometimes I don't know when my wife buys Nespresso. It might be because of George Clooney. It's Nespresso, OK? Nespresso has changed the business model of coffee, of espresso. The reason I choose this is because we can learn from it. And you can learn from all those disruptive business models out there because they have interesting mechanisms that you can copy, whatever you do, whatever kind of product or, or service you do. So at the core of it is a machine. Okay, who of you has never seen or never had a Nespresso coffee? Never. Okay? You haven't lived. Okay? You haven't lived. Okay? A little bit of nationalism here. I'm Swiss, so you know, I have to trump our products. So the question you should have is, what's the story behind this? What's the business model? And I'll run you through it, then I'll show you a different approach, and then I'll get you to do an exercise. Okay? So let's quickly look at Nespresso. The first part here is, how they sell the machines? They sell the machines through retail stores. Okay? You can get it in any store, you can get it in Media Markt, whatever, wherever, through retail, mainly to households. Okay? They earn a transactional revenue from that. Okay? Transactional. It's the big important point because transactional revenues are shitty revenues. You have to push to sell again and again. Okay? Now, they figured out that the pods could be more interesting, and they could earn recurring revenues. Okay? And they only sell the pods through their own channels, which means on the key resources side, they had to create their own channels. Why do you think would they make this difference between the machines and the pods? What's the strategy there? Why do they sell the machines through retail? 
Anybody know? Why do they sell? Cost? More space could be? Celebrating the brand, right? Celebrating George Clooney. There's another reason. Revenues, easier to get. Somebody said it's easier to get. Retail, retail is the broadest channel possible. So they will push the machines through retail. So you have a machine in your house. And what happens once you have the machine in your house? You're screwed. <laughs> because you can only put one type of pod into that machine. And it happens to be an espresso pod, which you can only get from them. So they don't need retail anymore. They can sell directly. What does that mean when they sell directly? It means they don't just earn six to eight times more. They earn all of it because there's no intermediary and they don't give away any margins. So as an entrepreneur, you should say, wow, that is crazy. That's a profit spitting machine. Okay? And it's recurring revenues, re revenues that come in again and again. So now the question is, what do they need to do that? What do they need? I call this the backstage. What do they need in the backstage? What do they need in the key resources? They need patents to protect the system. They need a brand. If you're not in, in this market and you don't have a brand, you're dead. They need coffee, obviously. Seems trivial, but they need good coffee because it's a high-end brand. And they need production facilities to churn out 12 billion pods every year, okay? Then key activities, business to consumer distribution, marketing, right, hiring George Clooney, and the production of the pods. And then very quickly you get the costs. So what's interesting here is you have all the pieces that make up for their success, okay? This is a story that fits together. Recurring revenues, switching costs, all very interesting characteristics that you can design into your business model, okay? Because it's the business model here that makes the difference, that turns them to an, into an insanely profitable company. If they just sold the machines, the pods through retail, it wouldn't make as much profit. And more importantly, run you through the results, fastest growing business still in the Nestle group, biggest food company in the world, 30% growth rates per annum over a decade, about 4 billion US dollars in revenues. But here's the big learning point for all of us. When Nespresso started out, they had exactly the same product, okay? Same product, machine and pods. Their first business model almost brought them, brought them to bankruptcy. Okay, they almost, they almost went bankrupt because the business model didn't work. The business model didn't work. Looked like this. They were doing a joint venture. This was a startup inside Nestle. They did a joint venture with machine manufacturers, and they were trying to sell the pods through the machine manufacturers, Salesforce, through their Salesforce, to offices. Two things were wrong, which they could have learned if they had tested their business model. The people in the offices were not interested. And more importantly, the sales force had no incentive to sell these machines. So the business model did not work. Okay? That was the difference between success and failure. So I know by experience that many of you are insanely focused on your product or your value proposition. Great, but you know what? That's just one piece of the equation. If you just focus on a great product or value proposition, you might miss out on success or failure or insane profits and mediocre profits between growth and no growth. Okay? So what you really want to do is both. You want to understand both. It's not either or, it's and. I think insanely great products only gives you the right to compete, doesn't give you the right to succeed. Insanely great products is what we all expect today. That's just the ticket to compete, okay? It's not the ticket for success. So let me just show you, well, let me just show you one video, and then I'll show you another approach and we'll get to work, okay? Little video to finish off the business model canvas. And then I'll show you a new approach that you probably haven't seen until now, okay? So the business model as a theater. Let's see if the sound works.
Okay, up a bit more. Great, back to school. <laughs> By now, you probably know the business model canvas pretty well. With nine basic building blocks, you can describe any business model in a more tangible, holistic, and visual way. To better understand the dynamics of the business model canvas, we can use the metaphor of a theater. Imagine the right-hand side of the canvas as the front stage of your business model, just like the front stage of a theater that is visible to the audience. The front stage is where you interact with your customers, clients, and users. Like in a theater, if we go behind the curtains, we end up backstage. The backstage of your business model is what makes the show in the front possible, but most customers won't see who's back here or what they're doing. The front stage is what represents value to your customers, clients, and users, and what they're willing to pay for. The backstage makes it all possible, and it drives cost. At the end of the day, the equation is pretty simple. A sound business model requires your revenues at least as big and hopefully much bigger than your costs. That outcome is called a profit. Okay, now so you've got a handle on the business model theater. Will you be able to put on a show? Okay, so it's pretty simple, right? Business is as simple as this. The financials at the bottom are an outcome of what you do at the top. Nine blocks that define your success. Now, I figured out that people are still very much in love with products and value proposition. So I thought, you know what? Let's give users, startups, senior executives an approach to better describe one of the blocks here, the value proposition. So let me switch back here to my little drawings. Let's pick this box and figure out if we could better define value proposition. So not just products, not just a bundle of products and services, but could we figure out what do we map out when we describe a value proposition before we make one? So I want to do a little exercise with you before I get you to work. Work in groups of two. I call these buzz groups. Turn to your neighbor on the left or right-hand side and discuss for two minutes what a value proposition is and then write down your definition, okay? Write down what a value proposition is. What's a value proposition, okay? Two minutes, write down your definition. Let's do this together. Let's do this together. Let's do this together. So first I'm interested, first I'm interested, before I ask you what a value proposition is, I get some definitions here. Who of you just talked and didn't write anything down? You just talked and you didn't write anything down, okay? You are all in the world of blah, blah, blah. That's fine. <laughs> Not very ambitious, but that's okay. You're in the world of blah, blah, blah. Who of you put down a couple of bullet points what goes into a value proposition? Just a couple of points or wrote a definition. Okay, fine. Not bad. Good start. Who of you made a diagram? Too bad, because I have Swiss chocolate with me. Good behavior gets rewarded, but since nobody has proven me they have a diagram, I'm going to have to eat these boxes myself, okay? And then I'm going to have to go running to get rid of it again. Okay, so too bad, okay? What you want to do is get out of this world of blah, blah, blah. So when you talk about products or value propositions, it's not enough to just talk. What you really want is some kind of method that allows you to sketch it out. Because when you have a visual method, like the canvas, for all your business discussions, I'll promise you, you'll have strategic conversations. So let's do this. Let's take the value proposition, and we're going to take something else, in fact. We're also going to take the customer segment, and we're going to describe those in a map, in a canvas, OK? So we're going to take these two, and we're going to make a map for a customer segment and the corresponding value proposition. And if we make that map, in fact, what we're doing is we're sketching out the problem solution fit, if you want, okay? So let's take customers first, and I'll draw here. Anybody know what this is? It's a customer segment, very good. Somebody has good visual thinking skills. Okay, you want to describe three things when you sketch out the profile of your customer. Three things is a very good start. The first thing you want to sketch out is what jobs are customers trying to get done? What are they trying to get done? Okay? 
Are they trying to find music, install music, <laughs> you know, steal music? What is it that they're trying to get done? Then related to that, you want to figure out, related to those jobs, what are the customer's biggest pains, OK? OK, turn your phones on, by the way, but tweet how good this session is if you have your phones on. Okay, please, please. OK, your biggest pains. What could a pain be? Installation, finding music, if you're looking for music. Describe all the biggest customer pains, the things that turn off a customer, the costs, time, budget, anything that pisses off the customer. Then on the other hand, you want to describe the biggest gains. What does a customer expect or desire when it comes to these jobs? So if you take a telephone, okay, what do we expect from a telephone? Number one, we expect that we can make a call, which Apple didn't get right for a while, okay? that you want to make a call with a phone. The other thing is, today, phones look really good. Samsung phones look absolutely gorgeous. Apple phones look very good. Nobody today, <laughs> nope, this is an Apple phone. I'm just trying to downplay that I'm an Apple fan. <laughs> Nobody today would put a Blackberry in a cafe on a table. It's a crime. You don't do that. It's a pain, OK? So you wouldn't do that. Today, we expect that phones don't just work well. We also expect that they look good. Okay, so those are all the gains. So once you figured out the customer, once you sketched out the customer, you start designing a value proposition. Okay, You design the corresponding value proposition that satisfies the customer. So anybody know what this is? It's a value proposition, right? Very good at drawing. I learned that from my nine-year-old son. Okay? And when you describe a value proposition, you want to sketch out three things. Three things. First one, you just make a list of your products and services. Okay? Products and services. If you are Apple and you're you know, selling the iPod, products is the iPod itself, is music, movies, and the service would be iTunes and iTunes Store. Okay, So you just make a list of that. But here's where it gets interesting. Now you describe how do your products and services kill pains. So this is, what is it? It's clearly visible. Come on. It's a painkiller. Everybody got it right. Perfect. Okay. So you're going to describe how do your products and services kill pains. Because you describe the pains over here. Hopefully, your product or service addresses some of the pains that a customer has. On the other hand, you're going to describe how does your, do your products and services create gains. Okay, So you're going to describe the gain creators. So if we could distribute now the, the little canvases. So we've got a couple of canvases. Value proposition canvases and sticky notes because I'm going to get you to work now for about for about six minutes, okay? So the point here is, like with the business model canvas, in a visual way you start sketching out first the customer profile, and then the value proposition, right? So you get a better understanding if you're doing a good job with your value proposition. Then obviously the next thing is. What do you do once in, you know, in a meeting or in a couple of meetings you have come up with a great value proposition you know, for your customer profiles? What's the next thing you're going to do? You're going to start talking to people, right? You're going to do customer development and lean startup. Because you want to figure out, is that really the profile of your customer? Are those real jobs? Are those real pains? Are those real gains? If you don't go test, all you're doing is intellectual masturbation. The real thing is getting out of the building and testing if that is correct. And you will iterate, like you iterate with the business model canvas, you will iterate through customer profiles and value propositions. So now, most of you have now one of these canvases. One per person, OK? One per person. Don't hoard them. OK, one per person because you can download them for free on the internet. Okay? So what I want you to do now is I want you to sketch out little three-minute exercise, three-minute exercise. 
Sketch out the customer profile of an entrepreneur. Sketch out the customer profile of an entrepreneur. What are the most important jobs an entrepreneur is trying to get done? What are the biggest pains for the entrepreneur related to those jobs? And what are the biggest gains of the entrepreneur related to that job, of being an entrepreneur, okay? Sketch out the customer profile of an entrepreneur. I'm going to give you three minutes, okay? Let's go. With your seat neighbor, do it in groups of two. Sketch out the profile of an entrepreneur. Okay, let's go. Come on. Everybody's got to work. You might even get some chocolate. Okay. Everybody listen. Everybody listen. So, when you want to do this exercise in a real world, world setting, what you want to do is you never want to write, nor on a canvas, nor on a business model canvas, nor on a value proposition canvas, because it's like a holy cow. You do not write on a canvas. The reason is somebody invented sticky notes, right? What you want to do is you want to sketch these things out with sticky notes. And I'll tell you why. Because when you have them in sticky notes, you can move them around. Because one of the things you want to do once you sketch this out is you want to ask yourself, well, what are the most important jobs? And you're going to put some order in that. What are the most important gains? And you're going to rank them. What are the most important pains? And you're going to rank them. If you write, you cannot change it. This is a playground. The business model canvas and the value proposition canvas is an entrepreneur's playground, OK? So you need to be able to play. So next exercise, you've done the customer profile of an entrepreneur. What I want you to do now is to design a value proposition. The value proposition you're going to design is the book of the 21st century for the entrepreneur. So in the products and services, you're going to tell me how that book looks like. Is it a book? Is it a call center? Is it a collection of videos? What goes in the products of services for the book of the 21st century for the entrepreneur, to teach the entrepreneur entrepreneurship? And then you describe how is that product going to kill pains and create gains. OK, I'll give you three minutes. And the best, the best group is going to win some Swiss chocolate, OK? So let's go. Three minutes, great value proposition. OK, let's do this together. It's a rapid prototyping, very rapid prototyping. So who has the best idea in the room? Because, OK, we got one person who's going to present there. Who else wants to present? Because we have Swiss chocolate to distribute, OK, here. And we got two judges in the front, OK? So I'm going to give them the chocolate. Yes, okay. the judges are Ash and Sean, who presented earlier. So some applause, please. OK. The judges. We're going to decide for the support. OK. Judges, 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 listen well and don't eat the chocolate, OK? You're going to have to give it to people, OK? So first idea over there, OK? 10 second pitch, 10 seconds. What's your value proposition? The um, book. Okay. Uh, it has to uh, have short videos, uh, audios, articles, whatever, and it has to learn him as he is doing business. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. So, second pitch over here. Still uh -huh. writing. Okay. Great. Did you hear the first idea? This is now the second one. Yeah. So the second pitch. Okay. So in all the forums of Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. One more over here while filming. Okay. Last last pitch for Swiss chocolate. You know how high the stakes are. Swiss chocolate is the best you can get in the world. If anybody else, like the Belgians or the Austrians, try to tell you. It's just not true, okay? Okay, your pitch. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. The goal of the employer should be to spend. It should be many disciplines. Okay. The matrix, how long you can spend. Yep. Psychology. Okay. The okay. problems from the public general without getting from the policy experience. Okay.
Multidisciplinary. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Judges. One more. One more no. No, I think that's fine. Oh, one right. more. Yeah, to have a gender balance here. Okay. One more woman, and then you need to judge. I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. Let's go. No, no, no. How to predict the future so that it doesn't need to, to, to read differently. And a cloning machine for them, a service so then he can do everything, what, whatever comes in. Great, perfect, excellent. Woo! <laughs> why, why hasn't anybody invented a crystal ball for entrepreneurs? Right, okay. Perfect. Judges, so make one you're decision. On Sean Ellis. Did one you make decision. Him up? What's the best, what's the best yeah, prototype here? Number two. Number okay. two. Which one's number two? Excellent. Number two was Stand over up. here. Stand up. Give it up. Okay. okay. So, get the chocolate. Yeah. Get, get. Don't be shy. Watch out. Be careful with those. Okay. They throw you to the heaven two. right away. Yeah. So. <laughs> now the importance here is. Let me get back to this idea of prototyping. Let me get back to this idea of prototyping. So you did a, a rapid prototype of a value proposition. And just like you could do a rapid prototype of a business model. Now, the one thing I want you to keep in mind is one idea, whoops, here. One idea can lead to very many different business models, very many different value propositions. And don't stick just to the idea. Sketch out a business model canvas. When you get really good at this, when you understand the business models of Nespresso, the business model of Skype, the business model of Facebook, the business model of Semex, a, a, a cement company, the business model of the Nintendo Wii, when you understand those really well, because this is your job as an entrepreneur, to understand how these companies have done an outstanding job. When you've done this well, your prototypes will not just be, hey, a different product. They will be substantially different business models, some with recurring revenues, some without fixed costs, some maybe in a, comp in, in a collaboration with your competition. That's what prototyping is about, understanding the different alternatives. Okay? And it's not just about products. Now, obviously, all this prototyping is still, I won't say it again, is still intellectual masturbation if you don't do this. Okay? And I think you heard a lot of this over the last two days. A business model on paper, a value proposition on paper, is worth nothing. What you really want to do is you want to leave the business plan behind you, that approach of the static document, where you refine and where you think, hey, I'm going to refine this, it's going to work more because I put more detail. That's just nonsense. What you really want to do is test. So let me visualize this. I burned the business plan before. Why? Because it's not about a static document. What entrepreneurship is really about is managing uncertainty, managing risk by iterating and pivoting through different business models and different value propositions. When you do this, and when you use a good understanding of business models to do this, in combination with customer insights and customer learning, that's when you're going to have this curve that's going to work. Not here, OK? Not here. So what you really want to do is testing. Now let me leave, I'll leave you with one last video. I'll just eat up the, the rest of the time to show you what I mean with competing on business models. Okay? One last video to show you what I mean with competing on business models. A little bit of food for thought so you can advance in your entrepreneurial career. Some of today's most successful companies understand that the competitive game is increasingly playing out between superior business models, in addition to the traditional battle between new products, technologies and services. Let's analyze the four levels of business model strategy. The first level is what we call a level zero business model strategy. 
Companies that focus mainly on product, technology and related services are at level zero. The best of them build great value propositions with a strong product market fit. The companies that compete mainly on better products and value propositions are often oblivious to the fact that they could outcompete others by combining their products with a better business model. Let's call this group the oblivious. Companies that just start to understand the importance of competing on business models usually perform level one business model strategies. They use the business model canvas to ask themselves which customers they're targeting, how they're reaching them, how they're acquiring them, how they're earning money from them, what resources, activities and partners they need to do that, and what's the cost structure. Organizations at this level understand that they need to look at the entire business model and its components but they use the business model canvas more like a checklist. Let's call these companies the beginners, who understand that products and technology are not enough. They've taken their first step towards competing on business models. Companies that know how to build outstanding business models perform level two business model strategies. They know that it's not enough to just cover all the components of a business model. Companies competing at this level have business models with a story in which every single piece of the business model reinforces the others and contributes to the story. A great example is the Nintendo Wii. Beyond the introduction of an innovative product in a game console market, they built a business model with lower costs, more customers and superior profit margins. They outcompeted their competitors on the business model. An older example is Dell, which disrupted an entire PC market with its business model. Another excellent example is Nespresso. At the center of their business model is a machine that makes single portion Nespresso. But what gets customers to pay six to eight times more for coffee, outperforms their competitors, and produces insane profits is the configuration of their business model. These are true masters. But it gets even better. There are companies that compete on a level three business model strategy. They don't just compete on a superior business model, but they already think of new business models while they are successful. These organizations build new business models proactively before a crisis or an industry or technology change forces them to. Sometimes they even self-disrupt or cannibalize their existing business model while they're still successful. These companies are very, very hard to beat. They are practically unstoppable. Examples are Apple and Amazon. They continuously innovate their business model despite their success. These are companies you could call the invincible. You decide where you want to compete. Level zero strategies focusing solely on great products and value propositions is like competing on training wheels. Level three strategies are more like a Ducati monster motorcycle. Guess which one outcompetes the other? OK, I'll, let, I'll leave you with the choice if you want to be with my five-year-old daughter with the training wheels or if you want to ride a Ducati Monster. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>